Good afternoon, good morning, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Casey Murphy and I'm ACT's Director of Programs and Events. I wanna thank you for joining us today for ACT's part two of a two-part series on planning and TDM, meaningful design and mobility decisions, elevating TDM's role in reshaping our communities. Before we hear from our presenters this afternoon, I wanted to quickly take care of a few housekeeping items. First, all of you are on mute. If you have a question or have a problem hearing us, please type it in the chat box located in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. We will do our best to answer your questions as the webinar gets going. Second, we will be hosting a Q&A at the end of the webinar, but please feel free to type in your questions as we go in the Q&A box located in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Please note when typing in your question, and please try to remember this, please type in who the question is for so we know when asking the question. Finally, this session is being recorded and we will have it up on the ACT website within 24 hours after the presentation ends. Now I'd like to go ahead and pass things over to David Strauss, ACT's Executive Director, to give an update on what ACT currently has going on. David. Thank you, Casey. Good afternoon, everybody. I want to thank you all for joining us for today's webinar. As the premier association for TDM professionals, our goal is to build a strong community of individuals and organizations working to advance and implement TDM at their work sites and within their communities. Webinars like today's are an important benefit to you as a member of ACT, providing you with valuable information on latest trends and important knowledge to make you more impactful in the work that you do. To each of our non-members joining us today, I invite you to join us and become a part of our community. I guarantee you that ACT membership will be a valued investment in your professional growth. After today's event, you'll receive a note from Elizabeth Denton, our membership experience manager, offering an opportunity to connect and learn more about ACT. I know we have a full program, but before we get started, I wanna take a moment to update everybody on some of the latest news from, from the association. Very soon, we will be announcing the reintroduction of ACT's More Through TDM legislation. This important piece of legislation aims to raise the profile, of TD, profile and use of TDM within federal transportation policy. The legislation codifies TDM, the definitions of TDM and TDM strategies which will help provide clear direction for USDOT about the role TDM can play, along with greater clarity on funding eligibility. The legislation would also provide significant new funding for the implementation of TDM programs and TDM, uh, and TDM plans. Stay tuned for updates on the introduction of the bill and how you can work with your member of Congress to earn their support for it. Staying on the policy front, we are excited to announce that Congressman Blumenauer will be providing a policy briefing to ACT members on March 17th. Blumenauer is a true ally of TDM and a staunch advocate for bicycling and public transit. Registration information will be going out to everyone next week. Registration is now open for ACT's uh, next two uh, national conferences. Our Future of Commuting Summit is a half-day virtual event on April 27th that will present ideas around future trends and the lasting impacts of the pandemic on commuting. Attendees will also have ample time to participate in interactive small group discussions during the event. You can learn more about the event and register on our website. Registration for ACT's 35th Annual International Conference to be held in person August 1st to 4th in Disney World is also now open. It has been great to see so many people already register to attend uh, this first in-person event in almost two years. However, we understand that there are organizations and individuals that may be cautious and un uncertain about their ability to join us in person this year. Please know that we'll be focusing significant attention on creating a safe event for all of those that will be joining us. To make the conference a bit more affordable during these economic times, we're also pleased to provide an extra early bird rate, providing an additional $100 savings off of the conference event, uh, off the conference registration uh, for individuals that register before March 5th. 
that's actually next week. So if you are thinking about it and want to take advantage of that savings, try and do so this week. Um, also note that you know we have updated cancellation, see, cancellation and uh, lenient policy on that. So you have till July 9th really to you know make a decision if you're coming or not able to attend. So now on today's webinar, and as I introduce the session, as Casey mentioned, we're going to pop up a, a couple of polls for everyone to complete. Uh, so today's webinar, Meaningful Design and Mobility Decisions, Elevating TDM's Role in Reshaping Our Communities, is our second of a two-part webinar series. And today's webinar continues an essential topic around the important relationship between planning and TDM. The session brings thought leadership and perspectives on how TDM professionals can navigate through competing forces that influence our everyday environment. The discussion provides a framework around the importance of TDM's role in redefining the industry, while introducing tools to reinforce design decisions, how rethinking traditional planning practices have taken center stage, and how the built environment impacts transportation choices. So it's now my pleasure to introduce our speakers today. We have Hayden Blackwalker, uh, who is the Director of Planning for Black and Vernui, I hope I pronounced that right, Architecture and Urban Design. Together with Sinclair Black, she co-founded Reconnect Austin, a community-based call to lower the main lanes of I-35 through Austin's urban core, creating a vision of a reconnected city fabric, which provides multimodal access to housing, jobs, medical facilities, and transit, with the goal of equity and transportation, increased safety, and access for all. Hayden also donates her time and advocacy efforts to the Congress for New, New Urbanism in Central Texas, the City of Austin Pedestrian Advisory Council, Cap Metro's Project Connect, Austin Outside, and Walk Austin. Hayden is a 2016 Fellow and Mentor for the National Walking College. Then we'll have Ann Sutfin, who is a Strategic Advisor at Seattle Department of Transportation's Transit and Mobility Division. She's responsible for implementing strategies and programs to achieve shifts from single occupancy vehicle trips to walking, bicycling, transit, and shared trips. As a transportation options program manager, she leads a team delivering a variety of TDM programs, as well as collaborations with other emerging mobility initiatives. Her work has included implementing innovative approaches for uh, infrastructure, information tech systems, social marketing, and education planning and policy work and building external partnerships such as Commute Seattle. Anne has more than 25 years of local government experience in city planning and transportation within the Puget Sound region. And to kick us off, we have Pete Costa, Principal Planner, Urban Mobility Planning Manager at HNTV, who brings over 15 years of experience in helping communities, businesses, and organizations prioritize their transportation investments to meet their fundamental goal of enhancing the built environment and quality of life. A people person at heart, Pete endorses a high level of transparency to the planning process, putting the interests of those affected by policies and programs at the forefront of the conversation. He believes that TDM is one of the most effective tools to bolstering economic productivity, social capital, and creating a sustainable future. Pete, I'll turn the webinar over to you. Excellent, thank you, David, and thank you, everybody. Uh, just a quick poll here. It looks like that we've got a pretty fair representation across the board, uh, which is really, really exciting, um, knowing that TDM brings such a, a diverse amount of topics and practice and service lines. Uh, it's good to know that the, those on the, on the uh, webinar today also come from diverse backgrounds um, in various areas of our, of our uh, everyday society. And uh, also, I know I just, uh, screwed something up with the poll, but it looked like that there was a fair amount of interest. I would say the majority of interest today is understanding partnerships between the public and private side uh, as to achieve greater goals. So, uh, which is great because that's really what we're going to be talking about today. Um, real quick, I just want to say thanks again for the opportunity to speak alongside this amazing group. I've had so much fun getting to know Hayden and Anne throughout this process. And I also want to do a quick plug for the ACT Professional Development Committee, which I serve on. And I want to let you know that ACT has a lot in store as we think about professional growth and development in TDM and as transportation mobility professionals in general. Um, I just want to add that, you know, we really do come at a critical time uh, in the transportation industry and community uh, development. 
Um, you know, we've endured over a year now with the COVID pandemic and, and the rise of social issues. And, um, you know, we've, as TDM professionals and others, we've been integral in uh, keeping our communities going. And uh, we all know that we simply just can't go back to normal and normal by a means of traffic congestion, um, public safety issues and lack of affordable uh, mobility and affordable housing. And, you know, TDM, in my professional opinion and personal opinion, has been and will continue to be at the forefront of the conversation, finding solutions and uh, being adaptive to change. And so really TDM uh, really covers the full you know, spectrum of the mobility ecosystem. And you know, through policy and programs and physical design, which we'll get into a little bit more in depth today, um, through those venues, we really understand the human element, you know, the built environment and the connections between how we move, why we move and uh, the scene around us. Uh, the integration of technology has been more pronounced now than ever. And how are we uh, integrating that even better now through lessons learned, but also as uh, the private industry becomes a little bit more savvy in terms of, uh, you know, co-creation and design think and understanding the user a little bit more and how is that getting integrated a little bit more. Uh, a large focus on health and design, you know, how are we creating healthier connections um, in our streets and in our neighborhoods, which we're going to get into much more detail with Ann and Hayden talking about specific areas of the Seattle and Austin metro areas. And it's all about building community, right? How do we actually support stronger land use plans, uh, which entail, um, you know, greater uh, mobility benefits? At the end of the day, though, TDM is all about creating opportunities, just like these, you know, dressed up fake Elvises on a bike share in Las Vegas. But at the end of the day, it's all about more mobility choices, right? You know, we've got these barriers to transportation. You know, you get off of work, you want to go meet your buddies. Traffic is just clogged right now. It's five, six o'clock and you just need to go a few blocks. But it's a good idea. My boss gave me a bike share membership. So this is, a, this is an example of TDM breaking down common barriers uh, to transportation and to opportunity. You know, you need to run errands. Um, you're, you know, your brother was supposed to pick you up. And you, you've got places to be, but you're so, you know, and your brother canceled on you. You know, what happened? Who knows? Well, so glad you heard about this great microtransit service that can be on demand and pick you up so you can get to that pharmacy and the grocery store and, and uh, carry on with your daily life. Or you just started a new shift. It's third shift. It's easy to get to, to work, but getting, you know, home is really, a, is really difficult. You know, transit service isn't running and you don't feel as safe and, well, it's, it's good that your employer uh, has a guaranteed ride home program. So here's just another example of TDM helping get people to and from their jobs uh, safely and conveniently. And then also you just move to town and you don't wanna own a car. You're still trying to figure out your journey and the bus stops over a mile away, but you live kind of an active lifestyle. So, wow, this new bike lane makes it real fun to get to, to my bus. So through design and thinking about creating those connections to opportunity, you know, why not a low stress bikeway? So I uh, just wanted to share a few illustrations about how TDM can really help address those common barriers to transportation. And, and we could go on and on at length about this, but I just wanted to share a few examples. But really ultimately design does matter, right? In, in really getting people connected to where they need to be. So when we think about safe routes to transit or really bolstering high quality transit improvements, you know, uh, a recent study said, you know, what are the three most important areas of improving transit service? And of the top three, it was about the safety of waiting and getting to and from that bus facility or that train station, right? It's the journey that matters just as much as the service that's being provided. So, you know, at times uh, transit agencies and other partnership agencies, you know, forget about the bigger picture and the holistic view that, you know, items, you know, uh, uh, elements and initiatives like complete streets really do uh, play a large role or, or, or vision zero campaigns play a huge role in, in, in uh, really fostering um, the high quality transit that we're, all, that we're all pushing for. And we're starting to be more and more progressive about our bike facilities, you know, uh, or just over the past few years, we are building more bikeways and uh, across our country and providing more bike lane miles but we're also reducing risk at the same time because we're really working with cities to understand that if you're going to start to consider bike planning within the right of way, really test it out, pilot it, but also keep that long-term vision to really maximize the highest and best use. So can we achieve that dedicated bikeway and cycle track 
eventually in, in, in the shortest term possible to encourage more biking and create more connections and safer connections and healthier connections. And we're starting to see that more and more and more, which is really great. We've got a lot of momentum here. Um, same with micromobility. We've read a number of reports and we work with a lot of private providers in that realm too, but we're starting to see results now. It's not so much about, oh, this is a new idea. Now we're actually starting to track and understand how has micromobility been regulated, but how has it also been able to complement our traditional modes and, and, and so forth and getting people to be more active, you know, putting in millions and millions of more hours of walking and biking just through e-bikes and e-scooters, encouraging that active lifestyle. But also throughout our major metro areas, it has increased the ability to get to jobs. And that's very, very important as we start thinking about mobility strategies through an equity lens and affordability lens and a connectivity lens. We start to understand now, are we getting people to be to, to more economic opportunity at the same time getting them to those uh, to, to um, those essential services? So the numbers are really, really uh, assuring that we're on the right path, but we know more work needs to be done. We understand that there's competing forces and we haven't solved all the issues, but there are private investments that yield public benefits. We've started, we've talked more about TOD. It's been around for a long time and, you know, the FTA and others are really uh, providing the essential resources and capital towards TOD development uh, in our country. And it's not just commuter rail and light rail. I mean, bus rapid transit and other, other types of uh, mobility networks, they're really starting to hone in on TOD. And here's a couple of examples of, of TOD at work and how TDM overlays with that. So how does it overlay? Well, here in, you know, in Oak Street Lofts in Portland, Maine, it's, it's a 10 ride Metro pass for, for uh, residents and employees. It's a paid bike share, car share membership. In Boulder Junction, in Boulder, Colorado, it's, you know, they have to abide by a trip cap, but in order to counter that, and you're not just penalizing people, you're also offering free eco passes and subsidized bike share and car share memberships as well to balance it out. In the same Portland, Oregon and Lloyd District, this is an example of, uh, of a TMA funded by a business improvement district, metro, parking revenues, all coming together to uh, really create a, a wonderful place that really brings a mix of uses and a mix of modal choices as well and incentivize uh, district uh, residents and employees. But as we're all starting to see now the trend, we need to start to foster uh, TOD and land use and TDM through an equity lens. And, and I know we're going to get into more examples of that with Ann and Hayden and the challenges and opportunities of that. But we're starting to see cities really take a bold stance. You know, the city of Chicago with their ETOD policy plan, amending their TOD ordinance and making it re a requirement for developers and allowing that flexible design requirements that prioritize multimodality. Uh, you know, in the Twin Cities as well, a guideline for developers that that essentially have a checklist that are they doing their job and are they ensuring that, you know, the community input is being brought into the fold as they, as they consider new developments uh, with TOD and any kind of uh, major um, housing or, or jobs infrastructure. And in Milwaukee as well with their neighborhood plans and really using their big uh, catalytic um, projects like streetcar and, and, and BRT to really spur TOD developments and understanding uh, how do we preserve uh, existing residents and businesses, but also really foster more of that economic development. So we're starting to see more and more of this all over the country, uh, developing these ETOD policies and guides. And this is really going to set the stage and the framework for the future. Uh, mobility hubs are popping up all over the country too. And here's just a quick example of a, a wonderful pilot study that was done in Minneapolis and understanding how all of these organizations can come together to really create these concentrated areas that offer all of these mobility resources, right? So it starts with a pilot and you start to understand, you know, these neighborhood level criteria, you know, you can't do the same mobility hub in every area, but how do you tailor that to meet certain needs and, and, and ensure that first mile, last mile and all coming together and, and, and the results have been great. You know, the users have, you know, shown that it's really offered more options and they're starting to take more options. You're providing the resources to encourage this optional travel and more sustainable travel. So the results are in. I mean, this is something that is creating a safer uh, environment, placemaking. So there's all these other co-benefits that are generated when you think about mobility hubs. And I think this will continue to be on the rise and you'll start to integrate electric vehicle charging and electrical uh, services as well for micro mobility. And it'll just grow and grow and grow. 
and then at the end of the day too, it's all about partnerships. I know this was a key takeaway from the polling results and understanding that it really takes, you know, two to tango, you know, and, and like the Lyft Divi bike share working with the city of Chicago and Lyft creating one of the largest bike share programs in the country and also doing a, you know, an equity piece and equity uh, lens to this as well and testing out are these service providers doing a better job at distribution of these resources and, and tracking uh, uh, trips You've got, you know, the Minneapolis, Saint, you know, Twin Cities area with Caribou Coffee with these really cool bus shelters working with architects and designers and placemakers to also create uh, a sense of place. But hey, you're also getting your head nice and uh, toasted while you're waiting for your bus, which is fantastic in, in that area. And then as we've seen over the past few years, too, we'll continue to test shared uh, bus stops, you know, with public and private uh, buses and uh, albeit contentious, I think the idea behind this is that we are maximizing the activity of our curbside use and consolidating services. And that's what's really important too, is maximizing that right of way. Uh, and that, again, that's another design function. So these are just some quick examples. There's so much more to talk about. And uh, I look forward to uh, your questions and answers. And I'm going to uh, now uh, pass the torch over to, to Anne. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pete. That was great. Hi, everybody. I'm Ann Sutphin from Seattle, and I'm going to be providing the local government practitioner's perspective for our topic today. And it looks like a lot of you are on the phone today, and we're from all over the country and maybe other countries. Canada, I saw, is here as well. I do bring um, a career and a long career in local government, solely in local government, um, as a current planner, a long range planner, transportation planner, and in the past about 10 years, I've been primarily focused on TDM programming and mobility um, solutions programming. I started my career in the suburbs in Red Redmond, 16 miles um, east of Seattle, and I've been in Seattle ever since. Um, common themes that I have had throughout my career, and I would guess that a lot of us from whatever perspective we're working on that are on the phone call today are about, have been about addressing high rates of change and growth, whether it be population and employment, the changing transportation network and the services that people use, the nature of work have changed and changed people's commute patterns and mobility and data innovations have really changed um, the way we work. Designing, another theme is designing for all of us, I think, or for me throughout my career has been, in, has been about doing designing, planning and programming that shape our communities towards more sustainable cities with more travel options and evolve us away from an American dominance around um, design dependence on private automobiles. Um, real quick before I go, I'm gonna just do a practice, uh, a land acknowledgement that I think is relevant um, for this uh, context today about thinking about physical space and people. Um, I am coming from Seattle, which is located on the unceded land of the Coast Salish people in the Duwamish tribe that to understand context of our work is ever so important. Next slide. This um, slide, um, our work has really been focused in Seattle on building and supporting a strong public transportation foundation. Our programs focus on getting commuters, mainly our, mainly our focus are about getting commuters on transit and especially downtown. And we've been hugely successful, as you can see from past results. Those have been built on a partnership story that we've told here before with King County Metro, our transit provider, Commute Seattle, a very strong TMA, um, and uh, in high employer engagement, um, showing itself in high subsidization and commuter use of our transit system. Next. Also, um, Pete has been talking about sort of multimodalism and the full system design. We've really focused on an integrated multimodal transportation system and that trans public transportation system needs to be supported by a strong, connected, protected bike network and building out a better pedestrian network linking to transit and other priority locations. Next slide. Um, engagement of businesses, the private side has been extremely important in Seattle. They, uh, they are part of our TDM environment and a lot of them are on the phone today. Uh, employer engagement is key and we've had, um, we've had a strong program with over 350 sites in the city where they're continuously engaged um, working with us and monitoring how they're moving the dial on mode shift. Um, and investing in local and programs on their site that have robust uh, path transit pass programs 
in really state-of-the-art amenities, transit amenities, micro-mobility amenities in an organized manner. Also, I mentioned Commute Seattle on their website shown there. They have, offer extensive programming and consultation with a lot of those resources available online. We have other, we work, develop other partnerships too. I put up there um, a, a nod to our traffic engineer. He would be a person that I would say is on par with Donald Trump on his prolific tweeting. And um, he um, really engages from, an, I would call him an activist engineer. He engages the community. He just tweets all the time with a real interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary approach. He notices things beyond things that uh, traffic engineers notice. He notices housing, he notices community design, he notices community building, and he's been a real strong partner and, and engages um, the community in ways that maybe traditional TDM programs don't. He also has done things like come to uh, the Starbucks, whose headquarters are in Seattle, uh, commuter bike club once with me, and I found out later on that he went back to talk facilities with them and get a lot of input from them and, and make some changes and plans. Next slide. The, our transit system, like many, has been growing um, extensively over the uh, past years. We are extending out and will continue to extend out a light rail line and as a, uh, this year. And as the uh, transit system expands from a more sort of servicing a downtown to a regional, truly regional light rail system, local agencies and private providers need to look to new solutions to connect that system. I call it the connective tissue. Um, that addresses that full user experience that, that Pete was talking about, whether it be transfers and first and last mile connections. The challenge I think there is just making sure that we, all of us at the local agencies, the multiple agencies, the service providers sort of row in the right direction to make sure that that system is as seamless and integrated as possible to serve our common goals and support a strong public transportation system. Next. Then came 2020. Last year really changed everything for all of us. It was a year like no other, other in my long career, and I am sure that it will profoundly resonate for the remainder of my work in this profession. Um, it really changed the assumptions we, ha we have made on how we define our mobility challenges and the problems that we try to solve. Um, our community, like um, most, was hit fast, hard, and disproportionately. Our peak commute transit ridership plummeted and our transit system kept running and struggled to keep running to serve essential workers um, who um, needed to get to work and uh, made more commonplace in our language, you know, essential workers and make thinking about essential trips and essential connections that will continue, I think, after we recover from this pandemic. Next slide. This, um, I think the impact of the pandemic is going to also affect our physical environment, at least in the next few years to come. Um, we, and, and also the programming we're doing. So on this slide, we did a survey with the, um, the properties and the, and the employers that we have most engaged. And we're seeing that um, the people that we're, we're working with are the ones that were able to stay home and work remotely. And, um, we will, you know, we'll need to think of, we are focusing more on the essential workers that aren't involved in our, in our program. Also though, community support is strong for public transportation. In the past year, we had a local uh, transit renewal, a uh, local transit service renewal that we put on the ballot. And I think um, we were actually uh, concerned uh, how Seattleites would respond to that, given that um, a lot of people, a lot of, not a lot of commu peak commuters had gone away but it had strong support and there's a strong support um, in Seattle. It, it passed for continuing um, a strong transit system as we rebuild. People got that connection and showed commitment. Next slide. I was mentioning the physical space. Um, this is a clip from um, Seattle Times looking and showing that while a lot of the office workers in Seattle uh, on the left and in many cities stayed um, employed and were, were working at home, the slide on the, right, less, uh, on the right is speculating that office demand, particularly hard hit Seattle, could um, really plummet um, or, or decline in the, at least the next year ahead. This is gonna provide opportunity to rethink and reimagine the use in the space of our downtowns. Next slide. 
uh, our city, like many, had to act quickly in responding to the COVID emergency and changing the use of our right of way in ways that we had never really imagined would change so quickly, um, addressing social distancing and economic survival uh, for small businesses by rebalancing and um, curb use, by re retiming our signals with reduced traffic, um, automobile traffic and more pedestrian traffic closing streets so that people had social distancing for local active transportation, walking and biking and remaining healthy, and then providing space uh, for retailing and businesses so that they could survive when they were not allowed to have uh, people inside uh, where it was not safe. Next slide. Another uh, major event of last year that is related um, um, but separate that we cannot and will not forget was the murder of George Floyd and the nation's reaction to similar harms of black bodies. This was going to change our, this is going to change our thinking about planning and mobility design. Uh, as a white person, I, I recognize that whiteness has dominated urban design thinking and concepts of mobility and access, predominant thinking, and that this narrow mindset has errors, errors and emissions and outcomes that are achieved and can create space that is actually unsafe for black people. Uh, we're doing uh, efforts in, uh, at the city. We've had a race and social justice initiative for 15 years, but we're really uh, doubling down and focusing on actionable efforts now. We've had a transportation equity work group, which is community members who are compensated for their time who are developing recommendations. And we will be seeing their recommendations posted publicly later this year. Um, we're looking at engaging um, the groups, uh, the black centered organizations that do exist in our community now and helping build their capacity. Bike Works um, is led by a gentleman named Ed Ewing who came from one of our biggest bicycle clubs, Cascade Bicycle Club, where he started the major Taylor project. Rooted in Rights was a disabled community, uh, a representative of the disabled population and help uh, give a lot of input as we design micro mobility so they feel that uh, scooters and bikes, that they're not creating more of a problem for, the, for them um, and that they're supportive of their needs. And then new efforts, um, well, the Peace Peloton was a movement that emerged this summer um, of people taking bike rides to black owned businesses and has really been a sensation and they're launching fresh air rides across the nation for the empowerment of black people and um, creating lots of people riding and, and, and biking um, during this time and it's really exciting. Our, our department's also engaging our municipal court and academics and looking at um, fines, cit citations, and how um, those are rendered in the public space around walking, jaywalking, biking, helmet laws, and getting lots of insights there to see um, what we might do moving forward. Next slide. So I think the big, for me, the big themes I'd have what's ahead in mobility design as a tech practitioner in TDM would be around um, four areas that I've identified. First is um, the shift of the right of way allocation. I was mentioning, you know, the making a lot more space, taking away car space that we've taken away in an emergency response and what, what that might mean going forward in a sustained economic recovery or rethinking about that space. Um, also addressing issues around mobility justice that I mentioned and ever-changing demands with right-of-way allocations. Also curb use um, is uh, ever-changing for us. Our parking group, we have a great on-street parking group. They just two years ago renamed themselves to curb use management because uh, the really how the curb is being um, used is changing. Pete talked about um, uh, electrification. So we're, if we're really gonna make a, and the other Pete in Washington, if we're really gonna make a move towards electric vehicles, how and where are we gonna change all those, uh, charge all those cars? This past year, the rise in e-commerce, Seattle's the home of Amazon, but across the nation, the e-commerce king, but across the nation, uh, the uptake on e-commerce and local deliveries. On my block, I see, uh, local deliveries coming endlessly during the day, and that's going to be a demand, continued demand on downtown. Downtown, and then um, just prioritizing for other active transportation, protected bike lanes, and for transit priorities, make a, a continual um, programming of rebalancing our curb use and right of way. Another theme as a TDM practitioner would be um, what's going to happen with this uh, remote work um, that we've we're we have really super high levels, particularly for office workers um, and remote work. 
and the likelihood from what we're seeing about how um, private corporations are responding to that, for that to be sustained at high levels for a really long time. What does that mean for our commute programs? Do we think about work from home commute trips and try not to make all, uh, people shift to just driving from their home? Um, and also the 15 minute city where uh, Seattle is a neighborhood, a, a city with lots of neighborhoods uh, with the aim to make um, services walkable and, and bikeable and what opportunities does that bring for us? Then finally, one I've already touched on is the public transportation system. We have a strong public transportation system in Seattle, but we had high, high ridership in the, commute, in the peak commute and we were solving to the peak commute program uh, problem. What will our future uh, be as uh, the office, at least the office sector of workers responds to maybe a hybrid commute and how we shift and change our, our transit service delivery and how our TDM program supports that and brings back ridership or supports new ridership for new connections in our communities. I'll, with that, I'll turn it over to Hayden. Thanks so much, Anne. I really appreciate it. Um, so I'm Hayden Blackwalker. I'm coming to you from Austin. I really appreciate the opportunity to um, be with you all today. And I wanted to specifically thank Alex Scarbo for suggesting me for this panel. Um, I spend my time working on projects and advocating for a better built environment um, that revolves primarily around making streets safe and comfortable for all road users. Austin's a pretty classic Sunbelt city um, that since World War II um, has been primarily focused on building roads and um, spaces for cars and single occupancy vehicle trips. So um, I want to tell you a little bit about what we're doing to change that. I'm going to focus um, on the built environment, but I wanted to take a second to acknowledge the great work of both Movability Austin, our local TMA, and Smart Trips Austin um, for their uh, really amazing TDM programming and their ongoing work. Next. Um, so this is Congress Avenue, our main street in Austin's downtown. You can see the Capitol in the background. This is back before World War II when there were still streetcars and lots of people and lots of mixed uses. Next. After World War II, we did what most American cities did. We went from, you can see that 38 square miles to 325 square miles um, today. And uh, the region around us is four times that. So we have a very sprawled, very car-centric environment like a lot of newer um, American cities. Next. I always like to throw in one of Ian Lockwood's cartoons. He always does a great job of reminding us what's important and the fact that you can't solve land use without density and you can't solve either one without transportation so we really need to think be thinking about that whole thing as a package next slide um, we've uh, learned that lesson pretty well near the university of texas we have 50,000 students on campus and 30,000 faculty and staff um, and we allowed very high density um, near campus so that most people can walk onto campus there's really no place to park anyway um, next Unfortunately, we haven't really applied that lesson very well in all areas of the city. So this is a typical road in Austin. Um, this happens to be an old state highway that with a lot of urban development around it that lacks sidewalks and bike lanes and safe crossing. These kinds of roads are deadly. Um, they're high speed um, and they're very inhospitable for people. Next. This is a South Congress, which is another old state highway. Um, you know, here we've added painted bike lanes and sidewalks, but this is not a safe environment or a comfortable environment for people to, to navigate. Um, the paint is not going to protect a bicyclist from any moving car. And um, then we have these huge driveway cuts that we started calling drive walks <laughs> because it's not really a sidewalk, it's a driveway. Next. So this is the same street two miles away where you have wide sidewalks, lower vehicular speeds, um, lots of connectivity, lots of places to cross. And with COVID and a, a lot of the rapid implementation that's happened um, in the last year, there are actually protected bike lanes on this street now as well. Next. Austin's did a good job of shifting policy um, to really start to prioritize moving people efficiently and safely. Um, unfortunately, um, we have this sort of uh, push and pull with the state that I'll get into a little bit later. I think, I think Austin is doing a really great job. I'm not sure that 
that the communities around us or the state is doing such a good job. So I just wanted to point out, you can see here, one of the things we did was highlighted our high injury network. This is true for a lot of American cities where 8% of our streets account for 70% of our serious injuries and fatalities. And 40% of those fatalities are people that are walking. So we have a lot of work to do. Um, and the ASMP is our North Star. It, it sets our direction for, as you can see, policy number one, prioritizing safety um, in the network. And one of the things we've been able to do recently is reduce um, speeds on all of our downtown and neighborhood streets and most of our arterials, which is making a big difference. Um, so the overall goal of the ASMP is to reduce those drive alone trips at 74% down to 50 by giving people choice. Next. Um, so this is just a reminder, I love this image, that you know we can design roads that are really designed at high speed and then put a speed limit sign out there that says the road is 20 and wonder why people drive really fast. Or you know, from an urban designer planner perspective like I have, um, we can design roads that tell people to drive safely and prioritize um, safety and comfort and um, connectivity for everyone in the network. Um, next, please. So the other thing we've been thinking about, I think Anne touched on this, is thinking about reducing parking and um, what, we, what space we give over to cars and how that space can be used differently. Next. So this is an example of how we used to prioritize um, fast moving trips out of downtown. Uh, my office wrote the Great Streets Master Plan for Austin, which covers all of downtown. Um, this is obviously for high speed one way traffic lanes to get people out as quickly as possible. Next. Second Street today, because of the Great Streets Master Plan, um, has wide sidewalks, lots of trees, dense mixed uses, um, development, and lots of people. It's a place to go to, not through. That's the same street today. Next. Um, so the Great Streets Master Plan was audacious for its time and it's made a huge um, impact. But I want to point out that sometimes it's the little things. Um, this is a major renovation that the city took on in a neighborhood pool. The pool included a very expensive lift to carry a wheelchair down into the water. Um, but it took advocates saying, hey, wait a minute, there are no sidewalks, no curb ramps, no way for someone in a wheelchair to actually get there. So sometimes those details can be really important. Next. Um, so advocates have been really involved in getting multiple bonds uh, issued to provide active transportation facilities, including urban trails next and sidewalks, safe routes to schools, Vision Zero. These are, this is our new our pedestrian and, um, and bicycle bridge, uh, new bike lanes in the city. And of course we, we need parking for bikes uh, to make that comfortable for people next. I wanted to point out that some of that money has been used for specific treatments in case this is helpful in your cities. Um, raised pedestrian crossing tells cars to slow down, but it also tells people that they don't have to step off the curb down into the road space to actually cross the street. The pedestrian hybrid beacon that you see on your right um, is a dark beacon in mid block to help people get across the street. Um, it's dark until someone pushes it, flashes yellow to warn cars to slow down and stop, and then goes red to allow people to cross the street safely. And then we've been adding a lot of leading pedestrian intervals. This is, doesn't require new equipment. This is just an added phase in your signal phasing that gives a couple of seconds to people on bicycles or walking or in wheelchairs to get out into the road space um, before traffic. So it improves safety considerably next. And then we love seeing new streets like this where um, there's one lane of traffic, park cars for safety, trees and alley service to those high density units which creates a continuous sidewalk network next. Um, so in addition to that bond, advocates really felt like um, we needed the bond in large part because we had a tax rate election at the same time in November for um, to tax ourselves. Uh, for a building the complete Project Connect network. That's our new transit system that will come online. And we wanted to be sure that there was a complete network of active transportation that actually gets people to transit. And then that, because of advocates that also included 300 million in anti-displacement funding, next. So I just thought it was fun to see how much our original streetcar network that had been ripped out um, really resembles our new plan that we voted on in November, next. 
Um, and I wanted to just touch quickly on this issue of state versus city. So while the city is doing all these things to improve um, TDM and transportation choice and safety, the state is um, widening all of our highways as quickly as they can. Next, uh, this is I-35 through Austin which cuts through our major urbanized, urbanized areas. Um, you see downtown on the left, it cuts through the state capitol complex and the University of Texas at Austin, next. It was built in the 1950s and really divides the city along racial and historic lines and creates a barrier. And here's just an example of land use choices and how we give over so much land to um, the highways in particular, next. Um, but communities across the country and around the world are rethinking these highways and really coming up with ways to either remove them or mitigate them. Next, one classic example is the Embarcadero in San Francisco, um, which was damaged by the Loma Prieta earthquake. Caltrans wanted to rebuild it, San Francisco wanted to remove it. Next, and instead of just prioritizing single occupancy trips, it now prioritizes multiple modes and access and gives people choices. Next. So TxDOT wants to widen I-35 to 20 lanes through the middle of Austin, despite their own studies showing that TDM is really the way to solve congestion. Next. Um, and so I just wanted to point out that in case you're looking for good evidence of induced demand, this is the Katy Freeway in Houston, which is a classic example. It's 26 lanes and more congested than ever. Um, but there's also this congestion con report from Transportation from America, which um, takes 24 years of data from the Federal Highway Administration and notes that in every US city where they added highway lanes, even where the city's lost population, congestion um, delay actually increased. Next. So I really wish that TxDOT would spend their billions um, on Project Connect instead of widening highways, this highway to 20 lanes and um, not really solving congestion next. So we have a community-led vision called Reconnect Austin. I won't go into it because we're short on time, but you can look it up on the web and see our website. Um, but we propose express lanes below and a boulevard at the surface to handle all that local traffic and turning those frontage roads that exist today into tax space next. Um, this is our, just our image of removing that highway barrier and building city at the surface next. Um, and there's 136 acres in this urban area that TxDOT owns in right of way where they could be making a, a more informed decision about next, including um, long distance and commuter trains or buses below grade and rail or local buses at grade to help move people next. Most cities in the United States are facing um, highways that are at the end of their lifespan and we really do need to consider um, this is a paradigm shift in how we deal with this in our city. So we are really hopeful that our new Secretary of Transportation and the great team he's putting together, um, as well as this proposed bill um, to fund highway removal and mitigation will begin to really change the paradigm. So thank you very much and I'll hand it back over. Thank you so much, Hayden. Thank you to all three of our panelists this afternoon. Um, Want to get to the questions here. Again, if you have questions for any of our panelists here in the next 10 minutes or so, please go ahead and type it in the Q&A box. If we are unable to get to your question, uh, please feel free to reach out to any of them. They'd be more, to ha more than happy to follow up with your questions. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start with you, Pete, because uh, this was a question that came in early. Uh, when you say 30 million hours of shared microbility in North America, do you mean Canada or the U.S. only? Um, they want to make sure that they tr you truly mean North America, which includes Canada, I mean, Canada and Mexico. So can you please clarify? Uh, yeah, I'll have to confirm the publication of that resource. Uh, I want to say it was all of North America, but I'd have to I'd have to confirm that. Excellent. Okay, this next one's for you, Anne. And where do you see developers coming into play with the future of mobility? And in what ways should local governments be requiring funding for travel mitigation infrastructure? And when they build in an area, particularly urban areas, how much weight should we be giving to the response to their responsibility to help? Ooh, that's a hard one. Um, I, first part, um, developers' role. I'd, I'd like to welcome it, Hayden and Pete might have some ideas as well, but I'll, I'll take a try at it first. Um, I think they do have a role about um, shaping mobility and, and they're interested in access to their site. And I think having a forward 
thinking um, more and more developers, regardless of where you are in America in the context, are seeing having a forward thinking about um, not just designing for cars is good. Um, so along those lines, I think parking supply uh, is important um, and shaping the future. I mentioned earlier, you know, what if things change in parking supply and um, uh, in demand, being ready for those changes. Reef is a major parking manager in our city and other cities. And if there is a low demand, being really creative and reuse of that space um, for new development in the cities, you know, what kind of parking you put in, how you design the site for access, the walking routes and the, the bike routes um, uh, and the access points should need to be thoughtful and um, work um, for all users in the, in the building, um, to the building. Um, also, we've seen um, some of the developers in Seattle, many of them see uh, like TOD or biking and walking um, com commuter f um, screens and things. Those are amenities. They're, in fact, um, um, people were demanding them. We had one of our top developers telling a story how he had a tenant coming in and saying they wanted a bike room in an older historic building. And he did the pro rata and he saw putting that bike room, whatever it was, like $40,000 penciled out. Um, as far as mitigation, um, they do have a role. I think it's very localized um, across the country. Um, and American land use regulations are um, uh, different are, you know, applied differently across the country, but they should, you know, the standard language is they should have their pro rata share and they should pay, pay, pay for or participate in the um, share that how they uh, uh, influence and impact the mobility system. But thinking about a future, not just um, in, um, mitigating for cars, but planning for the future and mobility and being creative and how that mitigation is decided and what it's serving is, is key. Also, um, developers can be um, voluntary, not just part of development. Like the, we have examples where um, major employers have funded additional uh, transit service in Seattle and other amenities around the city um, um, voluntarily to advance what they think are their private development objectives that support the city's goals. Yeah, I would just add just working with other uh, developers across the country that, you know, most, you know, developers are more savvy. They're understanding, you know, what kind of community benefits they do need to bring if they want to play and build in the sandbox. And they are becoming more and more aware of the regulatory measures. So when I showed earlier the ETOD plans, um, that is that those are examples of uh, the framework to really, you know, sharpen the regulatory teeth to say that if you want to, you know, you want to do business in this town, well, that's great, but you're also going to ensure that, you know, you are going to invest in these mobility investments, whether it's widening sidewalks, uh, creating all new accesses to train, you know, nearby adjacent train stops and uh, providing the bike facilities, for example. And we've seen this pop up all over the country. I know years ago in San Francisco at the Better Streets program, you know, they were really adamant that, you know, you build, you're required to do X, Y, and Z. It's the same in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and, and it's, it's popping up all over and that they're really understanding that this from a city's perspective to really use that regulatory, those regulatory measures to require these types of developments and get it signed through a developer agreement to ensure that procurement of new buses or you know, new infrastructure is all set in stone and it's going to be built. Excellent, thank you. He didn't anything else to add before I move to the next question? This next one, all three of you, um, please feel free to chime in. To influence TDM, is it better to focus on the builders slash developers, the building managers slash employers, or zoning overlays? Can you point to best practices, resources for these options? Anyone want to take it away? I don't know. I'll just say that, hi, Lonnie. Lonnie and I work together in Austin, <laughs> so I'm not sure I have a whole lot to add that he doesn't know about, but we certainly have had luck in Austin with zoning overlays, especially, as some of you may know, we've tried for the last eight years to rewrite our land development code unsuccessfully, so zoning overlay has definitely um, helped near the university and really demonstrated the power of, of TDM in that environment. I'll pass it on to whoever else wants to add something. 
I just said all of the above. I think it's the, the influences come from different areas. Uh, uh, local practitioners, planners have the most influence on zoning. So that's really fundamental. For buildings and developers, um, that's shaping things at development. So that's site design. In Seattle, we, we do that. As, and uh, we also do some TDM. We do a, 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 a require transportation demand management plans for certain types of large buildings. Um, that gets things started, but um, building developers are usually not the same people managing the buildings later on. So um, if you wanna have ongoing programming and active programming that keeps up to date, um, involving the building managers employers is important too and showing the value for them as far as being a competitive attractiveness for employment, what their employees want or having a competitive and accessible site um, within your community. Yeah, I would just add that just always be equipped to develop the business case. Um, developers at times will always focus on doing the bare minimum to get through. Um, and as we know, and then we talked about today, I mean, that's just not acceptable. Um, so it's building the business case, as Anne was just mentioning as to why it's important, uh, you know, developer or developer groups to really focus in on understanding the community goals and what needs to be done and understand, you know, Again, I, I'm on repeat, just building those community benefits that go well beyond just the, con the, the boundaries of that site. Uh, but yeah, as Anne said, it, it really is all the above. Awesome, thank you. We have time here probably for one more question, try to get in. Again, if we do not get to your question today, please feel free to reach out to any of our panelists. But I think this last one would be a nice way to wrap things up. Pete, I'm gonna put you on the spot and start with you since you're the last one here to respond. For all three of you, what are the primary barriers, challenges, challenges that each of you are facing, uh, that you face in advancing TDM strategies locally, and how do you address it? Right, the biggest barrier is um, communicating what TDM actually is. It's really the fundamentals of it all. Um, it's, it's, I'm not shocked by it, it's just many, uh, even people in our industry, but also in just planning and engineering and, and development, they don't know truly what it is. Uh, to overcome that, you it's it's small wins. It's having the conversation with city officials and DOTs and thinking about, are you thinking about a TDM policy? Are you thinking about uh, updating some of your zoning? Are you thinking about creating that kind of framework? And uh, when I have those conversations, the answer is, you know what, we, we really need to start thinking about this. Could we have sustainability goals and equity goals and affordability goals Hmm, where can we house all of that? So let's start that conversation. Ann? Did I lose Ann? Hayden, why, do you want to comment, Hayden? All right. Well, I'll just say, you know, I, I, we've talked a lot about it already, but it's really a an, an everything approach, you know, and kind of aligning all those policies and getting we've seen a lot of success with getting the right funding in place, which has been really critical. Um, but, you know, to go back to the highway example, Austin has an amazing climate equity plan that's about to be adopted. And how does doubling highway lanes through the middle of the city um, address climate equity at all? Um, and we just, we're just not on the same page. And so I think there needs to be more understanding of how land use and transportation work together and, and what we need to, to solve that, it's a really complicated issue, but it's going to take a, a, an approach that aligns, you know, a lot of different forces together. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and just to add on to that, I, I think on my last slide, I put um, the climate pledge arena, I didn't, I didn't explain that, but that was a subtle way of me um, pointing to that. I think, you know, sustainable communities and climate change are something that is in every community's mind and that needs to be addressed and TDM work has a role in that. The climate pledge arena is on Seattle center. It, um, it is gonna be the new hockey league um, stadium. It was key arena and Amazon, um, is sponsoring it and they put that uh, name, they chose that as their naming a uh, right to uh, put on the arena. So I think that uh, sustainable communities and um, climate change uh, resonate with every community and framing our work within that really helps. Awesome. 
Okay, we have reached the top of the hour, over the top of the hour. Thank you all for staying with us this afternoon. Um, I want to thank all three panelists again. You had so much wonderful information that you provided to this group. It was action packed and you could see from the chat, everyone loved it. So thank you. Thank you again. This was wonderful. Uh, for those of you still on the call, we want to let you know that our next webinar will be Thursday, March 11th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. It's going to be on uh, the topic of best ways for TMAs, employers and MPOs to work with with private transit agencies. I wanna thank you all for joining us again and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.